Thank you for joining us today at Discovery Park of America. I'm Katie Jarvis from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. I will be your host for this and other lessons with professors from the University of Tennessee at Martin. These lessons are for students in grades six through nine, but they will be of interest to anyone. In this lesson, we will be discussing the benefits and challenges of teaching physical education and activity during COVID-19 with Dr. Stuart Curry, an Associate Professor of Health and Human Performance. So Dr. Curry, thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to be able to Zoom today and learn about the importance of exercise uh, during COVID-19. Katie, that's very kind of you. Thank you very much uh, for this invitation. Thank you Discovery Park for reaching out and connecting with our university. Uh, we, we think it's probably one of the, the, the stronger things that we can do in higher education is, is connect uh, with our local community and surrounding communities. So very much thank you for, for this invitation. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, uh, great. I, I know it's, short, it's a short time frame, so let's go. Yeah, so um, I know you're about to start screen sharing with us. Yes. And so if you want to go ahead and, and do that. Okay. I'll start us off with um, one of the first questions that I think we might be discussing. Um, the, of course, what is the difference between phys physical education and physical activity? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I'm going to take a little bit of time in this presentation uh, to really sort of define what physical education is and physical activity and, and how, it, how it differs, but also how they work together. So if I switch over to the, the lesson objectives for, for today's lesson, and again, um, when thinking about putting this presentation together, obviously there's an awful lot of information I, I could cover. So I really try to sort of narrow it down to, to meet the time frame and then really sort of discuss some of the some of the major points that I think will be helpful, not only for our physical education teachers, our students, remote learners, but also families as well. So I, I hope this has far reaching application and benefit. So the lesson objectives include, identify the difference between physical education and physical activity. And there is significant difference and uh, I'll explain that. Identify what the benefits of physical education and physical activity are, and that's going to include both the physical, which many people know about, but now there's further research to support what the, the mental benefits of moving, being physically active, uh, have on overall mental, mental health and well-being. And then this is a very interesting term, and I don't know if you can see that if I, if I, oops, sorry, if I highlight it or place my cursor on there. What are the social benefits? And that's really a challenge today because we, we talk about uh, social distancing, uh, but we can still socialize, uh, except we just gotta be very mindful of, about keeping our physical distance, in particular, six feet apart according to the CDC. So we'll talk about some of the social benefits as well. And then identify really today's COVID-19 challenges. And as, as we talked earlier, Katie, we don't have a template for this. You know, there isn't a, a plan of action. So yes, mistakes are gonna happen, but I, I think that the goal of everyone, especially within the, the teaching profession, is to make sure our students are safe, healthy and well, as either they return to school or, or take remote or online learning. So that's, that's a real important uh, point to sort of discuss in this presentation. And then provide some practical examples. Examples not only for the students, but for parents, for teachers as well. Uh, not only will it occur inside the, the school environment, but also away from the school environment as well, because we know that the schools do provide the best opportunity for children to be physically active. However, in today's uh, climate, uh, that has changed. So we'll really sort of address those issues there as well. And then at the very end of, of the presentation, um, we'll provide some physical education and some physical activity resources for you, uh, coming from Shape America, coming from the CDC, that will not only address and provide teachers with great resources, but it then also looks into athletics and sports, because I know a lot of uh, teams are now returning either to practice or competition as well. And there's some guidelines there that I'll, I'll be discussing or for at least providing you with some resources that you can look into uh, further at your own discretion. So that's really sort of the, the lesson objectives for today. All right. How, how, does, that, how does that, that sound? sounds great. Let's do it. All right, okay. Do you want me to carry on now? Let's go. All right. 
So let's, let's discuss uh, the difference between physical education and physical activity. So what is physical education? Well, first and foremost, uh, being a professor that, that teaches future students, uh, I'm very passionate about physical education. I'm a real strong advocate for why physical education is important. And, and let's, let's be clear, physical education is and should be considered an academic subject because it does provide value. There are national and state standards that we apply within teaching physical education. So our national standards are developed by Shape America, of which there are five national standards. We then also have our state standards that were being developed by TAFERD, uh, the acronym T-A-H-P-E-R-D. So the Tennessee Association of Health, Physical Education, Recreation and Dance. So when we teach physical education, there is a, a curriculum. We do apply state and national standards, but the main goal of physical education today, according to Shape America, and according to these five national standards, is to develop physical literacy. Now, physical literacy is a term that we, we're familiar with in education. I apologize, uh, that may be the train coming past. I had no control over that. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> okay, as long as you can still hear me. Yes, so I can. What, what is physical literacy? Well, physical literacy, again, it is incorporated into each of the five standards. So we have five national standards for physical education and they all address this key concept, the development of physically literate students. And the term itself means having the confidence, so if we're confident with our performance and having the competency, and the competencies will come from the development of motor skill the understanding of how and when we apply motor skill. That then allows us to move, and we know what the benefits are of movement, and we'll address some of these benefits later on, across our lifespan. So not only are we looking to develop physically literate students within the K through 12 school system, but we're looking for a lifetime, a, across a lifespan, to provide individuals to be successful with moving to meet all the health benefits associated with, with moving. So that's, that's a real important goal right there. Uh, so that's really sort of a brief explanation of how you would define and how really you would apply physical education uh, within the school system. So does that, does that make sense? Is that that, does, that does make sense. I remember being in elementary school and it would always be PE. Yes. Short for physical education, but Correct. you know, being in elementary school and maybe even middle school, I didn't really understand, you know, that it had more to it than just playing dodgeball or you know doing some jump roping and stuff like that. So well, that's, that's, very... that's a great that's a great point you, you bring up there. So we have, in terms of what we should be teaching, so we have some guidelines in terms of what we should be teaching at different levels because obviously. If we think about the school systems, it's broken down into elementary school, it's broken down into secondary school, and, and our students need different, different lessons, different skills in terms of acquiring skill acquisition for lifetime activity. So, you know, a, a real focus in the elementary school is the development of fundamental motor skills. Mm -hmm. And if you're unfamiliar with the term fundamentals, we're talking about non-locomotor skills. So, the ability to work on your balance. And if you think about young children in terms of their progression for movement, they're always struggling with balance because gravity is always trying to push us down or push us over. So it's very important for young children to be able to balance, uh, to be able to have good stability and to be able to have strong equilibrium. So when they do move, they're moving with success and they're moving safely. And that really does come back later on in life because with the elderly population, sometimes they really do struggle with balance issues. So if they're not being taught, then we're really doing a disservice across the lifespan. Mm -hmm. So we've got non-locomotor, then you have locomotor movements, the fundamental skills. That's running, hopping, skipping, jumping, leaping. If you come from a, a sport background, that is essential for for sport participation. If, if a student cannot run, I don't know how they're going to play basketball. They're really going to uh, be challenged in terms of playing tennis, etc. So these fundamental skills being taught, taking time to teach these skills, assessing these skills, and that's another component about uh, physical education. We, we should be assessing 
skill development within within physical education as well because if we cannot assess how do we know what students are learning or not learning and then finally manipulation so i'm not too sure katie what sports you play uh, do you play any sports that require you to strike or hit an object well, I played volleyball in volleyball. high school. Yeah. Okay, so you really had to develop your manipulation skills of setting, serving, digging. Bumping, yep. There we go, bumping, diving, <laughs> diving spiking, because I'm sure you're very, very successful. So <laughs> these are the skills that you, you have learned. And then obviously these skills require practice. So that's where time is really important for physical education. And, and this year we've released a Tom Cronin bill that really looks at uh, the application of quality physical education in schools taught by qualified certified physical educators. But time is really important. So here's something to take into consideration for you, for you to think about. When we talk about time to learn a motor skill, it, it does take time. Mm -hmm. According to Shape America, elementary students should be receiving 150 minutes of instructional physical education per week. Mm -hmm. That breaks down to 30 minutes every day. Mm -hmm. We're not quite currently there and there's challenges which we're facing, but that's a goal that we're trying to work towards. As you move then into secondary school, middle school and high school, that number increases to 225 minutes. Wow. So what, if we want- What's the math on that? <laughs> that yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit more, uh, <laughs> but that's our national <laughs> guideline. Uh, that's our, our national perspective in terms of how much time should be devoted in order for our, our, our students, our citizens, to be able to move with confidence and competency. So mm -hmm. I hope that really sort of gives you a, a deeper dive into this term physical education. But it's, yeah, correct. We, we, we call it PE. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I, I, I include this in the, in the slide is I've had several discussions and a lot of people were using the two terms interchangeably, mm -hmm. uh, but not quite correctly. So I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on that. Yeah, that was as, great. As for physical activity, this is any body movement that expends or requires energy. So examples, and it doesn't have to be, you know, lifting weights. It doesn't have to be uh, vigorous activity. You know, a lot of the guidelines according to CDC uh, American Health Association, we're looking at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per day. But that all depends on the individual. That all depends on their age, their experience, what their activity levels are or have been. And what we do know, uh, Katie, is uh, currently because of self-isolation due to COVID-19, the likelihood is our students returning back to school, back to physical education, may not have been very active at all. all so right. we've got to very much take that in consideration. So some activities that, that relate to physical activity, it could be walking, it could be uh, climbing up and down stairs, it could be hiking. These are all sort of activities that expend energy. Going out and cutting the grass, mowing the grass, gardening, everyday sort of living activities like cleaning your car. These are all examples of physical activity. So it really relates to energy expenditure. And one of the best ways that I, I was taught the difference between physical education and physical activity is, as it relates to physical education programs provide the foundation of a comprehensive school physical activity program. So it really does, if we can develop these skills, the likelihood is children can be more successful. And when they're more successful, they're more likely to enjoy the activity. I don't know of anybody uh, that is uh, that doesn't enjoy or isn't successful at playing, say, golf, as an example, the likelihood is they're less likely to play. So mm -hmm. development of these skills, really important. Give the student success. So as a teacher, I can make some modifications. I can develop different types of activities, use different types of equipment. Uh, one strategy is when working with younger children, don't teach adult sized games. Right. I also come from a, a coaching background as well. And too many times, uh, my background is in coaching soccer, or as I call it, football, mm -hmm. uh, coming from England. Um, I've seen too many uh, practice sessions where they're using the full-size goal and a full-size adult field. Well, the children are out there of a certain age. They're not able to cover that much ground. They fatigue quite quickly. But more importantly, if you play on an adult size field or tennis court, they're less likely to get practice opportunities. 
And if you don't have practice opportunities, you take away the learning. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really important. But as I say, physical education really does ch provide children with a great opportunity to increase their physical activity for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And then finally, QPE. QPE stands for Quality Physical Education. So again, it should be and include instruction and the instruction should be based on state and national standards. So when we develop lesson plans, we always have learning objectives and the learning objectives we always address are the psychomotor. So we look at the motor skill, mm -hmm. the cognitive domain of learning, which is the thought, the understanding, the processing, the analyzing. These are all education terms. And then the affective domain as well. And that's really sort of the socialization. So yes, we're, we're, we're challenged with socialization, but it's socialization in terms of the physical, but we can socialize in different ways. And I'll address that towards the end of this presentation. Okay. How are we doing for time? We're doing good. Okay, all right. So let's look at some of the benefits of physical education and physical activity. So as I said beforehand, when we teach a physical education class, what we're really wanting the students to do are develop the following domains of learning that relates to the psychomotor domain. So when we, we talk about physical education and teaching physical education, we're really addressing skill. And this word motor means movement. So we're looking at developing movements. We're looking to develop these fundamental skills, especially at the elementary school level where they learn the non-locomotor, they learn to balance. So when you catch a ball and you catch the ball outside of your base of support, if you cannot move that foot to recapture your balance, you're going to fall over. Mm -hmm. And what we know is in young children, their center of gravity is higher in an early age. So when you see young children first learning to walk, you see their body lean forward. They're not used to putting that other foot out to get the center of gravity back inside their base of support. Then they fall over. So you learn and you, you teach those types of skills. Very, very important. Twisting, turning. Mm -hmm. That's all about balance. Uh, think about in our elderly age. Uh, currently right now, I know Amazon are delivering a lot of, lot of packages. Mm -hmm. Well, you go outside, you pick up that package. Well, if, if balance is an issue, that can cause injury. And then when you cause injury in the elderly population, uh, that can be a real, real issue with um, several life issues right there. So mm -hmm. these fundamental skills, balance, non-locomotor, manipulation, and locomotor skills are really, really important. Again, uh, for developing physical literacy. And then what we have in terms of developing these psychomotor skills will address skill related fitness components. So you're looking to develop, and I like to call this the ABCs, apostrophe S. So the A, the B and the C with the apostrophe S for physical literacy. So you look at developing agility, you look at developing balance, you look at developing the coordination. And again, when you played volleyball, Katie, you had to be coordinated in terms of serving the overhand serve, which is very uh, representative of tennis. So mm -hmm. we combine those in terms of teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, then you look at power. And then finally, you look at reaction time. So reaction time in terms of development as a skill related component of fitness is really important. So when you were defending in volleyball, um, how did you react to an opponent jumping to spike a ball? We would have to, if I were, if I were at the net, I would be up there and I would have to time it. Correct. In order to hopefully block the, block the shot. Right. So what did you time it on? So you're looking at stimuli in the environment that's going to dictate your reaction to that. So these are all sort of the skills that we teach. You would have spent hours and hours of developing something we call technical skill. Mm -hmm. The technique, the technique of the bump, mm -hmm. the technique of the spike, mm -hmm. the technique of the overhand serve which i know is very difficult because you start progressively correct from simple to complex you start right. with an underhand serve first before mm -hmm. then progressing to the overhand serve mm -hmm. again using the principles of motor learning using the principles of sports skill acquisition break it down simply which isn't easy to do mm -hmm. uh, if you've ever taught ever uh, coached at a sport camp you know breaking skills down fundamentally can be challenging um, but it's really important for developing this, this term called technical skill. And, and so, then we look so, at, yeah, carry on. 
I was just going to say, so for our, for our viewers that are listening, yes. you know, it might be in grades six through nine, but you know, of course they could be high schoolers. Correct. So they're probably, you know, if they are in a physical activity sport, like volleyball or basketball, or I've, I know a lot of people play travel ball with baseball yes. and softball. Yes. Yep. So they're sharpening all of these skills. Yes. And, and they, that's a great, great point. They get a lot of time outside of school to practice those. So I've coached uh, travel select. Uh, I've coached within the Olympic development program for, for soccer. And mm -hmm. we spend hours with practice, but mm -hmm. unfortunately in school physical education, um, we're hoping that our students get at least 30 minutes of physical education twice, twice a week. Mm -hmm. uh, which is which is challenging to develop these skills. So mm -hmm. if a student has enjoyment, if they are self-motivated, going home outside of the school time period and practicing these skills and giving students an understanding how to practice in their own time would be really, really beneficial. Because yes, in, in, in sports, in travel, in select, uh, we do get that opportunity. But physical education isn't just about the elite performer. It's about getting every student, accommodating all students to allow them the same opportunity to participate and develop skill to be physically active. And that, that's a really important message. And, and thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. So to me, this is, this is a really strong point now for advocating for strong physical education. So a lot of science, a lot of research, a lot of evidence now links that there is a very strong correlation. There's a really strong relationship between physical activity and academic performance. The development of brain cells called neurogenesis is created through movement, through physical activity. There are several studies that show individuals that perform at a higher level in terms of their fitness perform better academically. So combining both, and if, if you're unfamiliar with Go Noodle, which is based out of Nashville, they call something called brain boosts, whereby you incorporate movement into an academic lesson, such as reading, such as math, such as science. So this is a resource uh, that I would highly encourage you to, to look into further. And if you're a physical education teacher watching this video, just go to Go Noodle. Uh, and they'll provide you with a lot of resources. They're fun. I actually teach our non-physical education teachers Go Noodle so that when they go out into their school systems, they can incorporate movement into the school day. And what we do know is, especially today, sitting in front of a video or a computer uh, can be really challenging for young children. Mm -hmm. So I would highly encourage breaking these, these lessons up with including something termed brain boost. It used to be called brain breaks. Mm -hmm. We want to move away from breaking away from learning. So we now want to try and boost the brain's activity to learn, comprehend, understand, apply. So that's, that's, that's really encouraging. You know, this research to support best teaching practices identifies this really strong correlation between movement and development of brain cells and academic performance. It also helps the students stay on task. Mm -hmm. It also helps with focus, attention, you know, after a very short break in moving and if I had more time, I'd stop my video right now. I'd say, <laughs> right, everyone get up, let's do a brain boost. And it could be something as simple as doing some jumping jacks. Mm -hmm. um, we've all played uh, rock, paper, scissors. That's movement. It doesn't have to be vigorous movement, but it, it's got to be movement whereby we increase the heart rate. And then when you come back, and then you continue lesson, uh, you have greater focus, you have greater attention. And then also, uh, it's also shown to be positive in terms of student uh, behavior as well. Mm -hmm. And we know that we can really help students if they're attending, if they're healthy, and if they're focused. So that, that's a real sort of strong push now in physical education. And then finally here, the third domain within a physical education lesson looks at the affective domain of learning. And this, this is really our feelings, our emotions, our attitudes towards movement. And to me as a physical educator, this is where I can really help students. I've got to make sure that students are enjoying their experience. You know, gone are the days of just running laps. Right. You know, what is I, the benefit? I remember doing that. Yeah, every, everybody does. And maybe that's, that's uh, some of the stigmas attached to physical education. You know, 
the way that we go about improving physical education is by obviously using evidence. And unfortunately in the past, many of the principals, many of parents, uh, yourself said you didn't really have a, a great physical education experience. That's what we must change because if children are gonna move and benefit from movement, not only in school and out school, they've gotta have the, the correct attitude. They're gonna to want to do it. What we do know is children enjoy playing games. Uh, today, even more so, I know in, during over the COVID period, children were sat at home. I know video games, very, very popular. There's this term called gamification culture. Uh, so they, they play games. Physical education can accommodate games. We have something called a game-based approach to teaching physical education that places students in games first, then teaches a technical skill, then puts them back into the games. Having taught and having coached sport for many, many years, probably the number one question that is asked is, when can we play? Yep. So why don't we look at and revisit physical education? We can use this model to teach physical education. And what research does indicate is using a game-based approach really has increased and has high impact on individual motivation. So self-intrinsic motivation to participate, which is, which is really important. Mm -hmm. So that's really looking at the benefits of physical education. Now let's look at the, some of the benefits of physical activity. So we have five health-related components of, of fitness. Um, and if we look at it, and this, this probably you would have learned this in either middle school or, or high school, we're looking at the development of being physically active improves overall health in the following areas. Cardiovascular fitness, mm -hmm. muscular strength, mm -hmm. muscular endurance, flexibility, and then one of the, the real health issues we're dealing with uh, currently right now, not only in this country, but Western society is obesity. So how does this impact body composition? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now there's even re more research to look at uh, the impact that obesity has on overall health. And there's now a, a research looking into obesity in terms of how it's impacting with the coronavirus as well. So uh, just really interesting to see what the benefits are of being physically active. And again, it doesn't, a lot of people, when they think about physical activity, they think about, well, I've got to go out and run. I've got to go to the gym. No, right. start off simple, go for a walk, go for a hike, enjoy nature, enjoy the sunshine. As you can see here, I'm out outside. I try and break up my work day uh, with some physical activity. And I'll, I'll talk about what I do later on in the slide. Sure. And then what we see here is also physical activity and the benefits towards mental disease. So stress, we're seeing a huge increase in terms of stress within not only uh, society, but also within our, our schools. Mm -hmm. Anxiety, you know, children are gonna be anxious, possibly stressed going back to school. Uh, I know a lot of schools are going back this week. Children are coming from uh, their home environment. They, they, they may not be aware of, of what's going on outside their home environment. So there could be some anxiety and there could be some stress. So physical activity helps with that. Depression, and then some really serious mental disease issues, dementia. So as we, we move and as we age, Alzheimer's. And then a lot of research now looks at the benefits of physical activity that deals with addiction as well. Mm -hmm. So these are sort of some really strong areas that by increasing or incorporating physical activity into your daily schedules can have some real benefits. And then socially, you know, currently right now, yes, we've got this term social distance, but to me, I have a better understanding in terms of physical distance, but we can still be social. Mm -hmm. uh, we can go out there, we can walk with friends, as long as we keep our distance. Right. Um, as long as we, we, we take the, the safety precautions identified by the CDC, which is a great resource. But it allows us to talk, it allows us to share ideas, allows us to, uh, share what we've been doing uh, during the day. Social media, uh, we, we're still very much social on social media, uh, but we can incorporate that with physical activity as well. You know, uh, if you go with a, for a walk, if you go uh, for a walk and you take your phone with you, maybe you FaceTime a friend. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's definitely ways that we can incorporate and develop the social side with and through physical activity. And hopefully when we get to the end of COVID-19, uh, we're going to see the continuation because this is what I've seen. 
I've seen a lot more people walking in my community. I've seen a lot more people cycling in my community. Uh, that's been a real benefit in terms of uh, people reverting back to physical activity mm -hmm. uh, for not only the health benefits, so hopefully we can also get the, the benefits uh, back through playing sports and being more physically active as well. Right, uh, and also going back to the social and like the social media, I yes. know TikTok has exploded. Oh my gosh. <laughs> During COVID-19. TikTok, TikTok's everywhere. I, I walk yeah. down uh, supermarkets and I see people TikToking. Yeah, and so, but they're doing some physical, you know, they're dancing, Correct. moving. So yes. um, that has, that, I could see how that could be, you know, a physical activity that um, during the COVID-19 shutdown. It, it is. I mean, that's, that's a great point. My, you know, I, I think, you know, physical education, physical activity does need a rethink. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what, what meets the needs and interests of today's students? Mm -hmm. And what we do know is TikToking is okay. very, very popular. Right. Dancing, very, very popular. So why not include that into a physical education program? Providing students with choice mm -hmm. is a real key, key factor in terms of maintaining uh, physical activity participation, not only during the school years, but also uh, following or post school years as well. So that's, that's a great point. Yeah. All right, so these are what I think, and, and through additional readings, some of the teaching challenges today. Really, if we think about education, there may be three models of learning that are being applied currently within the school system. Number one, is in-school instruction. That requires physical distancing. We see here, that can be incorporated both in physical and health education courses. But because of the physical distancing requirements, that's gonna provide challenges. You know, a lot of physical education classes have 30 or more students. When I do some workshops, a lot of questions would be, okay, well, how can I teach when I have 50 students in my class? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not the case today because you won't have that many in there. Mm -hmm. But definitely the, 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 the physical distancing will, will be a, a challenge. Then we have, as I discussed, the opportunity to increase physical activity through classroom-based physical activity. Again, if, if you've never incorporated that, uh, a lot of concerns the classroom teacher will have will be safety. And that's always our number one responsibility and our number one concern. And again, there are resources at the end of, of this presentation that will provide you with some further information, but always please take into consideration student health and safety is our number one responsibility. But we do want to get them up. We do want to get them moving. Uh, again, it doesn't require a lot of equipment. Uh, one of the great ways is by using exercise balls to replace uh, chairs at desks. Mm -hmm. When you include exercise balls, you're going to engage a lot of the body, you're going to engage the core. Uh, so that increases, they're going to be bouncing. Another benefit is for those students that may fidget in class, that never happens, right? Mm -hmm. right. Uh, <laughs> to get them back on, on, on task, you know, if a student is able to, to move at their desk, that can also help them, them focus as well. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately recess as well. Now, um, something we've got to take into consideration when providing movement during recess is the use of equipment, playground equipment. Mm -hmm. So we've got to always make sure, again, by following the CDC guidelines in terms of sanitation, wiping down, that's very, very important so that children can, uh, can play, can be physically active very, very safely. But one of the simplest things children can do, and there's a great program, uh, I believe the program started in Scotland, but it, it's now global, is the one mile challenge, whereby children walk to increase their, their distances uh, during the day. And that, that's nice and simple. That, that could be something that could be incorporated into during recess, but again, uh, making sure that we, we do stay nice and safe and, and keep our distance. Mm -hmm. The second model of, of learning in today's education is distance learning. So many children are taking classes at home via online platforms, and that brings a, a, across a lot of challenges. So how do we incorporate physical education through online means? And again, Shape America is a great resource for this. Absolutely fantastic. Um, one of the, the, the key points is making sure that the content 
is accessible for all. And again, that's possibly rethinking physical education, rethinking the types of activities we want students to do uh, in, in terms of the current climate. And I'll talk more about that towards the end. And then the third type of model for learning is this hybrid learning approach. This is a, a, a combination where we have in-school instruction, but with physical distancing, but then we also include that in terms of learning from home or uh, learning more away from, uh, from the, the classroom itself. So that would provide us an opportunity to go over some key points, make sure students have some understanding, and then allow the students to continue their physical activity when at home or in their, their own time. Possibly using um, asynchronous learning as an opportunity or synchronous learning as well. They, they could provide some opportunities there as well in terms of teaching using an, an, an online platform there. So these are sort of some of the key priorities in terms of student safety. So again, one of the main points I made at the very beginning of this presentation would be, you know, our number one responsibility is student health, safety, well-being. Okay, so how do we accommodate that? So first and foremost, make sure we have a very strong understanding and comply with both the state, local and school district guidelines. A great resource for you again is the CDC that looks at how we can incorporate effective, safe physical education, physical activity within the school systems and outside of school. If you're unfamiliar with this, it is recommended that schools create a school-wide COVID-19 response team. It keeps the entire school informed. Uh, the team is responsible for looking up the latest information, sharing, disseminating information regarding what seems to be not only week by week changes, day by day, and I'm sure principals would agree with me, even minute by minute, as well as parents. So just being uh, aware about what the late, latest changes are and how it impacts education is really important. In terms of supporting students, create a trauma sensitive learning environment. What we mean by that is you know, really taking in consideration and checking on students' emotional well being because they're, they're, they may have been in self isolation. You know, getting to know uh, the student's environment in terms of what, what they've spent and how they've spent the, the, the past few months dealing with COVID and then transitioning the student back into the school, school system and taking uh, care of their emotions, how they're feeling, you know, checking in on students is really important. I know we all live very busy lives uh, and it's very difficult when we're teaching to really sort of connect individually with students, but this, this really, I think, would be very, very helpful just to find out how students are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But then also, not only students, but your, your faculty themselves, your, your peers. You know, how, how are they doing, uh, how, are they, how are they coping with the challenges that they're facing? Yes, respect physical distancing and remain six feet apart. Uh, one way that we can do that within the gymnasium is by using poly spots. A lot of times we use that in terms of taking role. Uh, so we can use hula hoops in terms of, okay, this is the area that you're gonna be working in and we separate it by at least six feet or, or more. We understand that face coverings should be worn where possible. And again, use and see the CDC guidelines, especially how it relates to physical activity as well as sport participation. Now, through an increase of physical activity, through physical education, we've got to make sure that we have good oxygen, good circulation. And what we do know is when we participate in physical activity, we see an increase in respiration. So the need for oxygen real good circulation of oxygen, keeping doors open, keeping windows open. Not bad if we actually go out and participate in physical activity, physical education outdoors, if that's possible. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately addressing, readdressing, communicating, educating regarding personal hygiene, regarding equipment, wiping down equipment when it's used, equipment safety in terms of um, how it's used, how it's put back, how it's taken out. So overall, you know, really having a, a keen emphasis on sanitation uh, with equipment, uh, with um, anything that, that, that we're in contact with. 
And then finally, provide opportunities for connection. You know, that, that socialization, we are social beings and we do need to socialize, socialize. So not only both with peers, but also with, with teachers as well. You know, make that connection. Um, I think that will be really, really helpful for everyone. Absolutely. I was gonna pull you up right here. Yes. There we are, okay. Um, I was just gonna say, this is a great presentation and we only have a couple more minutes. Okay, all right, I tend to talk have to lot. pick some of your favorite ones to talk about, but this has been okay. really very, very interesting and very, very good, especially I think of, you know, back to the example of people playing travel ball, because I think some people, at least in Tennessee, are going back out and getting yes. back out into the, in the physical activity world um, with the bait. I always think of baseball. So encouraging them to wipe down their bats and, yes. just, you know, don't use your, your buddy's uh, m uh, m um, glove or anything. So. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and what, what, what's really good there is uh, the Tennessee Athletic Association has been really good in terms of giving directives, guidelines, and if, if you're not familiar with those, that moves on to my great uh, transition right in here, Katie, just moves into some of the, the resources that I think will be really helpful for, for not only teachers, students, but also parents, families, whether you're in, in class or learning remotely, and then these areas here, uh, the play organization provides a lot of good information. Aspen Institute provides a lot of good information about returning athletes to performance as well. Uh, to me, Shape America has been really, really helpful in terms of providing documents for re-entry into the schools. A lot of information I presented today um, was, was read through, through those uh, pieces and um, resources that, that are available online. So uh, Shape America, uh, if you just go to Shape America, it really does provide you with some fantastic resources. And then we have some sports and recreation resources right here. You know, it's difficult times. We don't have the, the perfect solution. But what we do know is if you're active, you get to feel better. It has health benefits. It has cognitive benefits. It doesn't have to be complex. You can start simple and then work towards more complex. My schedule, every morning I go out for a run. I actually run with a dog. Uh, so the dog gets some exercise. I come back. I participate in some body lifting exercises. So I do push-ups, sit-ups, squats, lunges, tricep extensions. And then I start my, 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 my school day. Then I start work. So my brain is alive. My brain is active. Uh, I've got my exercise in. I'm ready to go, to go for the day. Right. And that's what I've learned from you. And then also from um, another professor of health and human performance, that it's important not only to get physical exercise, but it also helps with your mental health and, yes. you know, kind of getting up and taking a walk. If you're maybe at home, you can walk your dog for 10 minutes or just getting up and doing some sort of physical movement. And it helps. Yeah, there's all sorts of science now, research to support what the, the health benefits are of having a pet. And uh, I've got two dogs. I can take one dog for a run. Uh, I'm lucky to keep up with that dog. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, just getting outside, try and get a routine. Routines are really helpful. Try and incorporate physical activity throughout the, the, the day. It doesn't have to be one block of 60 minutes. Research now supports that it can be intermittent in terms of the number of minutes, but trying to get at least 60 minutes. But again, that's gotta be based upon the person's needs, experiences, what their fitness levels are, etc. But there's a lot of information out there. If I can be of further help, please let me know. This is something I'm really passionate about, just reconnecting uh, with our local communities. I, I think it's really important. And again, thank you very much, Katie. Thank you very much, Discovery Park, for, for allowing us to connect with you. Well, absolutely. Thank you for taking time out of your day to do this with us. And of course, thank you to all of our viewers today for joining us. We look forward to continuing our mission here at Discovery Park of inspiring children and adults to see beyond. For more educational resources, visit our website at discoveryparkofamerica.com slash education. See you next time.